something I'm really interested in. Yeah, yeah seriously, I got this freaking degree. Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the university to the first program in the 1991 E. Pauline Ryle Lecture Series. This begins our third year of this series and we're deeply indebted to the generous bequest from Ms. Ryle for making this program possible. As has always been the case in this lecture series, we have been able to present a nationally prominent and outstanding ed educator to speak with us on a timely subject in the field of education. Uh, if he were here, I would say from the Delmarva Peninsula to the slightly larger peninsula of the state of Florida, which incidentally happens to be my home state, we would warmly welcome Dr. Paul S. George. Unfortunately, Dr. George has delayed somewhat and uh, will be here, however, so we beg your indulgence, but in the meanwhile, we'll try to uh, keep you at least uh, informed, if not indeed entertained. Let me now introduce to you Dr. Doran Christensen, the Dean of the School of Education and Professional Studies at Salisbury State University, to make some comments. Here I thought they'd ask me to sing and dance. I too want to join in welcoming, welcoming all of you to this event this evening. Especially I'd like to uh, welcome uh, the guests of uh, Bill Cotton and uh, the Eastern Shore of Maryland Education Consortium, a large representative representation of middle school folk are here as part of the Shore Futures Project, a project to identify and serve the needs of at-risk middle school children on the lower shore. We at Salisbury State University are very happy to collaborate with the uh, uh, Eastern Shore of uh, Maryland Educational Consortium in this project. It has been very good for us and for the, our people who are involved in it. For many years, I operated under the assumption that one goes to school to get answers. I learned in the first or second grade, I guess, that two plus three equals five, and somewhere along the way, got some answers about the phenomena of photosynthesis, causes of the Civil War, how to establish a business, are kinds of things that you learn in school. How to teach a child the excitement of reading is something else that's learned in school. However, as I've gotten older, I found that school is even more so for questions. Questions to go to, that go to what we believe and particularly to those things we believe most convincingly. It is very much the role of education to bring out in us the healthy skepticism that is necessary for true learning to occur. I'm really interested in the question of whether or not a butterfly's wing flapping in Tokyo will affect the weather in Salisbury. James Gleick asserts that is the case. I'm also interested in the question that is, the, are the solutions to the problems in our society to teach kids cooperation, not competition? Should we eliminate grades in school and merit pay at work. That was asserted by C. Edwards Deming in a USA Today article just three days ago. Or the question, are there circumstances when it is appropriate to censor free expression? That question was roundly and thoroughly debated 
in a seminar sponsored by the Fulton School of Liberal Arts just two or three days ago. The point is that we at Salisbury State University are extremely fortunate, I think, to be located in a setting where it is our job to try to provide answers, but more particularly, not to delimit the tough questions. In that spirit, the lecture you're about to hear this evening is a manifestation of that effort. We do indeed owe a debt of gratitude to the late E. Pauline Ryle for her vision in making this kind of identification of questions possible. We hope you enjoy the speaker tonight, and I think I saw him come through the door. <laughs> Welcome. Believe me, am I relieved. <laughs> I certainly appreciate your indulgence while we were waiting for Dr. George to arrive. And I can't, um, I don't know how to express my appreciation to uh, Mr. Bill Eckert, superintendent of Caroline Schools, who had agreed to pinch hit uh, in case uh, he did not arrive. So uh, let's give him a big hand. I already know you're in for a very special treat with uh, tonight's speaker. Uh, our speaker received a, a Master of Education from hum in Human Resource Development from Vanderbilt uh, University and a Doctor of Ed of education from Education at Peabody College of Education uh, Vanderbilt University, an MA from the history of, um, in History at Kent State, Ohio, and a Bachelor of Arts of History in Westminster College, Pennsylvania. He has taught public schools for a decade, and he continues to volunteer as a public school teacher one week each semester for the last 20 years. He's been a teacher, trainer, and professor in public schools, universities, human service organizations, and corporations. He's served as a consultant to educational groups of all kinds in over 40 states and nine foreign countries, including Belgium, Greece, France, Netherlands, Canada, Japan, India, and the NATO organization. In the past 20 years, he's addressed over 60,000 people at state, local, and international conferences. Guest lectured at 20 universities in America, Canada, France, and Japan. In research, he's published four books and approximately 80 chapters in books, journal articles, and multimedia materials. Recently, he conducted a research in Japan through a grant from the Japanese Society for the promotion of science for research in Japan on educational productivity. His interests are uh, primarily all aspects of the middle school, organizational leadership in education, and training and development in education. It is a pleasure to present Dr. Paul S. George, an outstanding international leader of the middle school concept. His topic is Middle School Movement, Magic and Mystery in Education. Dr. George. I can honestly say that I am really glad to be here. When uh, I found out uh, we were on the, in line to get on the plane at the uh, Washington National Airport about uh, 4.30 this afternoon, and uh, just before I handed in my ticket and got on the bus to be taken out to the runway, uh, one of the agents came in and stepped in front of me and said, stop it. And as it turns out, uh, one of their maintenance trucks or something at the, uh, at the airport ran into the plane that I was going to be on uh, <laughs> coming from uh, Washington to Salisbury. So uh, I immediately uh, went to the ticket counter and, and uh, started to complain and tell them how important it was that I be here by 8 o'clock. And they weren't all that interested, but a, <laughs> a, a wonderful woman who was also uh, on her way to Salisbury. Uh, and I need to put in a plug here for 
um, her company, which is Sunglass Hut. When they open their new store out at the Salisbury Mall, I want you all to go by <laughs> and buy a pair of sunglasses from uh, Sunglass Hut because she said, would you like to rent a car with me and go to Salisbury? And I said, oh boy, would I. And she said, I'll bet you'd even want to drive, wouldn't you? And I said, oh boy, would I. And she said, I'm a great navigator. And I said, oh boy, I'm glad to hear that. And we took off and we have been uh, enjoying the countryside uh, at a rapid pace here over the <laughs> last two and a half hours. Uh, but, uh, you know, things usually work out, and in this case they did. And uh, I am, in fact, happy to be here for, for more uh, reasons than uh, transportation. Uh, I'm happy to be here to uh, reacquaint myself with some uh, friendships, to, to make some new ones, and to talk about uh, a, a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart. This middle school business uh, really is a mystery. I mean, the fact that there are so many of you in here tonight to hear somebody talk about middle school education, in a lot of ways, is a mystery to me. Uh, <laughs> I have a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 16-year-old, and if it weren't for the fact that I make my living doing this, I'm not sure that I would want to go anywhere and hear anybody talk about uh, the lives of 12 and 14 and 16-year-old kids and how they might be improved educationally. Uh, this middle school movement is mysterious. It is uh, the, most, the single most successful innovation in American educational history. Uh, there are now middle schools in all 50 states, in hundreds of school districts, uh, and uh, middle school concepts being applied in thousands of classrooms, affecting many millions of students. The middle school movement has been going on for a century, I suppose, if you uh, identify its origins uh, in the junior high school uh, that long ago. The modern middle school movement has been going uh, full speed ahead for the last 30 years. I date it back to the beginning of uh, the, the middle schools that I know about uh, in Upper St. Clair, Pennsylvania some 30 years ago. I had the privilege uh, this summer of going back for the 30th anniversary celebration of the opening of America's, uh, of among America's first two really good middle schools. And it was a joy to know that after 30 years, those two schools are still as uh, vibrant and innovative and forward moving as they were 30 years ago. Uh, and it's amazing to consider uh, the things that have happened to education in the last 30 years. It really has been, in many ways, three decades of educational warfare. Uh, the fact that the middle school movement is still alive after uh, what we've all experienced in education and in this society in the last 30 years is magic in and of itself. But the fact that it's now spread all over the country and, and all over the world, uh, uh, in fact, uh, among many others, the Japanese are deeply interested in the middle school concept and what's happening here. Uh, because uh, they, too, are trying to find ways of increasing educational productivity without uh, crushing the kids. So uh, you know, I've, I've given a lot of thought to what this middle school movement is all about and uh, what makes it possible uh, for an audience like this one to convene here tonight uh, to be interested in a topic like this uh, in a very real sense my guess is that uh, your presence here is, is characteristic of the, the magic and mystery of this uh, middle school movement. The, uh, the fact that so many of you here are here and stayed along uh, as, you, as long as you did, recognizing that uh, the speaker might not show up, uh, is difficult to explain. Now, how do you explain the success of uh, the middle school movement thus far when, in fact, uh, it was born out of expediency and, in many cases, was implemented as an afterthought, uh, was forged in the heat of desegregation, 
uh, was implemented in, in many places because of declining enrollments, most recently because of, of uh, state legislation and national legislation. Uh, how do you explain that? How do you uh, come up with an answer to the success of the middle school movement? My way of explaining it, uh, recently at least, is that the emphasis needs to go on the word movement. That in a very real sense, what we're involved in is a movement, uh, very much like other movements in American history. And, you know, we as a people uh, are often intrigued by and participate in movements. And there have been many major movements uh, in America in the last 200 years in virtually every phase of our lives, uh, touching areas that are political, civil, religious, gender-based, military, but only one, save the, the possible uh, exception of the progressive education movement some 60 years or so ago, only one innovation in American educational history, in my um, knowledge at least, that has the right to refer to itself as a movement. And I think it's the, the characteristics of the movement uh, and uh, the characteristics that the middle school movement that shares with other movements that explains its vibrancy and its, and its success. Well, what does it share with the uh, human rights movement or the peace movement or religious movements uh, or the American Revolution for that fact, uh, for that matter? Uh, I think there are a few core components of successful movements in American history that the middle school shares. First, uh, I would say that what we're involved with here uh, is uh, easily, in some ways at least, described as in part the establishment of a new mission in education, a, a new vision of schooling based, uh, first of all, on the assumption that it's the characteristics and needs of the students that should determine the program, rather than basic skills students need to, beginning, to begin the learning process or in-depth knowledge of a subject matter that they might gain in a high school. And second, uh, it is the conviction that every single early adolescent in the school matters. Let me dwell on that just for a little bit. Uh, you know, the junior high school, although it was America's first middle-level school, the junior high school was a well-kept secret. A whole generation or two of American educators participated in the junior high school movement, and many of us were students in the junior high school movement without ever, or the junior high school uh, process, without ever really knowing what junior high school was supposed to be. Uh, I'm 50 years old. Uh, I just turned 50 last week, so it's right there in front of me. Uh, and uh, not too long ago, I went home to my parents, and the uh, phone rang, and I picked up the phone, and somebody on the other end of the line said, is this little Paul? And I dutifully answered, yes, Aunt Martha, this is little Paul. Well, you know, I really don't want to be little Paul. I love and respect my father. I never really wanted to be little Paul. But the closer I got to, to big Paul, uh, and the longer I spent near him, the more I had to act like little Paul, whether I wanted to or not. And in many places, the junior high became the, the little Paul of American education. The name cursed it from the beginning. A hundred years ago, uh, when we started establishing the very first junior highs in Florida and Maryland and, and other places, instead of saying, as we do now with this new vision, instead of saying, what, the, the, what does a developing adolescent need to know and learn in order to be successful and to grow strong uh, and uh, healthy, we said, well, what about the top 10%? What about the creme de la creme, the, the best and the brightest, the ones that are going to go on to high school. What is the high school like, and what can we do to fit together the junior high and the high school? Not an altogether unreasonable question, except for the fact that the outcome of it was that we decided that we would make the junior high 
an identical uh, but watered down version of the high school so that kids who went on from junior high to high school would pass from one to the other smoothly and easily. The problem with that is that 125 or 150 years ago when we established American high schools, instead of saying what the uh, growing adolescents need to know in order to do well in the future and to be strong and healthy, we said, what about the top 10%, the creme de la creme, the, the best and the brightest, where are they going to go after they leave high school? Well, the answer uh, down where I live, a hundred and some years ago and today, of course, is that they would leave and go immediately to Gainesville and enroll at the University of Florida and become good fighting Gators. And all over the country, uh, students left their high school and made their way to the state university, much like this one. And so all around the country, people fashioned high schools so that they would look just like the state university. The problem with that is 175 years or so ago when we established the state university systems, instead of saying what the young adults need to know in order to be strong and grow healthy, we said what about the top 10%, the creme de la creme, the best and the brightest, where are they going to go for more education? And back then, 175 or 80 years ago, uh, they left the University of Florida or Salisbury State or Maryland or wherever it was and went directly north to Cambridge and enrolled in graduate school uh, at the uh, university known as Harvard. You know, uh, the problem with that is that you know, I have two degrees from a place called Vanderbilt and in uh, its weaker moments, Vanderbilt refers to itself, some of you may know, as the Harvard of the South. And in every day, in every way, Harvard and uh, Vanderbilt tries to look more and more and more and more and more like Harvard. And so does Florida, and I suppose probably so does Salisbury State. I'm sure it's true of every uh, university uh, to some degree, perhaps except Stanford. Everybody tried to look like Harvard. <laughs> Problem is, when we established Harvard in 1636, Instead of saying what do young adults in this new nation need to know to help us be strong and grow prosperous, we said, well, where are the best and the brightest going to go for more school? And in 1636, if you went for more school, you went back across the ocean and enrolled at the University of Berlin or the University of London, medieval universities established in the year 986. Well, a thousand years of educational mimicry have resulted in uh, your sons and daughters and, and of course you and I uh, and my children attending in many cases junior high schools that were designed on the model established a thousand years ago for medieval German university students. And in case you haven't noticed it, contemporary American 13 year olds bear very little resemblance uh, to what I imagine a medieval German university student was like a thousand years ago. It just uh, no longer works. There probably was a time when it did work, but it doesn't work anymore. The idea of fitting kids into a medieval German university style organization doesn't make any sense. We know that 13 year olds aren't strong enough, aren't stable enough, aren't mature enough, aren't self-disciplined enough to be able to survive and succeed in a medieval German university atmosphere lowered down to the seventh or eighth grade. We've got to focus on what the students are like first and what they need and not on the school organization or the curriculum that some higher educational organization thinks might be best to prepare kids for entry into that organization. Now, I'm actually a really good example of the failure of the American junior high school. 25 years or so ago, uh, I emerged from Kent State University uh, with a master's degree in American history and the milk of my thesis dripping from my lips. And I knew that I had to get a job teaching 11th grade American history. I mean, that's where everything happened in social studies. If you wanted to be a social studies teacher of any repute whatsoever, you had to have a job teaching 11th grade American history. And I uh, went out from Kent in ever-expanding uh, radius 
looking for jobs teaching 11th grade American history. And in city after city after city, I was told, we just don't give our 11th grade American history jobs to teachers without experience, Mr. George. It's really great that you've got your master's degree in, in history to boot, but it's just not what we do. And I kept looking and kept looking and kept looking. And finally, I ended up in a place called Cuyahoga Falls. And uh, the superintendent was doing the interviewing in this uh, relatively small school district. And he said to me, Mr. George, I'm sorry, but we just don't hire uh, inexperienced teachers to be our 11th grade American history teachers. And I began to you know, bring my papers together and, and pack up. And he said, but wait a minute. We've got this eighth grade American history job. We can't find, for some reason, we can't find anybody to teach that uh, subject. I'll tell you what, he said to me, I've remembered it all these years, he said to me, you take this job and if you survive, I'll promote you <laughs> to 11th grade American history. So it was very clear, if I took the job, I'd be working with people on their way up, on their way down, or or not going much of anywhere, but I didn't have any choice. And so I took the eighth grade job, but I foxed them. I taught 11th grade American history. I just taught it to eighth graders, that was all. Actually, I had no choice. I didn't know what else to do. Uh, the only thing I'd ever seen anybody do was lecture. So that summer, I, got, uh, I was single and I had a huge table in my kitchen. And I got a portable typewriter, and I, I got all the American history textbooks I could find and opened them all up to page one colonization. I had two reams of Eaton Corazable Bond typewriting paper. Uh, you may remember you could erase with a rake on that paper and it wouldn't make a hole. And I, I leapfrogged Dr. Coran, my American history advisor, a whole generation in one summer because that summer, Felt tip pens had just been invented, and you know, highlighting hadn't even been dreamed of yet. And I ran out, I remember, and got myself a fistful of red flare pens so that I could really underline and check things and put stars by my notes and everything. And I remember I sat down, opened up the pages, page one, colonization, and started to type straight through. I started in June, the day after I got the job, and typed straight through to August 26th. And uh, I came to the end of World War II. So I immediately stopped because anybody in social studies uh, knows that nothing of any value uh, <laughs> has happened since World War II. Or if it did, you wouldn't get to it anyway. And if you did, the high school teachers would be mad. So uh, I remember I stopped and I went in. And uh, we had, it was the first day. Uh, we had one day of pre-planning back then. And the, the morning was a lecture, uh, a speech actually, a sermon uh, to tell the truth, by a local minister. And that afternoon we got our lesson plan books and a tour of downtown Akron, Ohio. I never have figured out uh, whether any of that uh, applied either directly or indirectly to teaching eighth grade kids. But I remember uh, that summer I had taken an elective in education. And I remember the education professor of whom I am now uh, a happy uh, member of that group. Uh, the guy said to me, well, we don't lecture anymore. Uh, we individualize instruction now. This is the early 60s, you gotta know. And so uh, I spent uh, the first three weeks of August, in addition to typing, building what they called learning centers uh, back then. And I remember my first day of teaching, I, I was what they called a floating teacher. Uh, these days, a floating teacher may mean something else, but back then, Back then it meant that I had uh, six different classes on four different floors. And not one classroom was repeated. Now, I remember I went into my, uh, my first period class and they had a podium, not like this. Uh, this is a, a lucky high school teachers get podiums like this. Podiums junior high teachers had back then were the ones with the long spiky legs on them and yet you pick them up and put them on your desk and one of the legs is always a quarter of an inch shorter, you know, so you can never put your weight on it. I remember putting my lecture notes down and standing by the lectern and the bell rang and in came these kids, you know, and I thought, oh, am I in trouble now? You know, because they were all about half the size I anticipated them being, but they were making twice as much noise as I could imagine possible, 
and they were touching each other in ways I've been trying to get my wife to touch me for 23 years. You know? And you know, I can remember uh, only only Henson Airlines makes my knuckles go as white as it as they did that morning. And I can remember my knuckles freezing to the, the lectern and uh, you know, really good junior high teachers. Uh, do you remember uh, Linda Blair, I think it was, in the movie The Exorcist, how she could spin her head around like that? Well, really good junior high teachers can do that without being possessed, you know, and you have to have tremendous peripheral vision, you know, and I remember, uh, you know, starting out lecturing on colonization, and out of the corner of my eye I could see bodies going through the air. And, Three days into it, I was about at the, st at the Stamp Act, I think, eventually. Uh, no, I guess it was earlier than that. I, uh, the bell rang, you know. It was a fire drill, and I thought, holy cow. Uh, I couldn't find my way from one class to the next, let alone memorize seven different fire drill schedules. I was the only teacher the first six weeks of the school that never wrote a, learning, or a late permit because I was always the last one to class. <laughs> You know, I lectured for 20 minutes, then I set up my learning centers, and then I went around and took down my learning centers and put them in the shopping cart and would take off down the hall. And, uh, you know, the, the, but anyway, the buzzer is going off, and, and I didn't want to perish my first week of teaching. And this kid says to me, come on, Mr. George, we'll show you the way out. You know, and I should have known, uh, but I didn't, you know. And, as it turns out, uh, Ohio has this strange way of funding its schools. You know, every day an Ohio school system runs out of money and closes down. Now that year, the bond issue in Cuyahoga Falls had been defeated three times already, and the, that great bastion of yellow journalism, the Akron Beacon, uh, was out to, to defeat the bond issue a fourth time, and they were getting all the dirt they could on the school system. Uh, so I, I remember I, this kid took me by the hand, you know, and we go walking out into the tennis court. Turns out I should have been in the parking lot. If I'd have gone to the parking lot, my whole career would have taken a different turn. <laughs> and we go walking out into the tennis court, and there in the tennis court is this photographer and reporter from the Akron Beacon Journal. And the next day on the front page of the Akron Beacon Journal was my picture like this <laughs> and the heading down across the bottom, not across the top, but nevertheless on the front page it said, Students Lead Teacher to Safety. <laughs> so I go back, you know, and I finish lecturing on uh, colonization and I look up and there's this girl in the back of the room with her hand up, you know, and I thought, geez, I wonder how long she's been there like that, you know. <laughs> Uh, her name was Martha Coger. Uh, she had a smile down where I come from. We'd say like a jackass eating briars. You know, she could show more teeth. She was a wonderful kid, uh, actually. Her father, bright as could be, her father was an internationally recognized expert on the South American condor. There weren't any in Akron. I never did know why he was uh, in, living in Akron. And uh, she, you know, she was sitting back there with her hand like that. And I said, well, now. If she asked me a question about colonization, I'm done for. Because I told her everything I knew about colonization. <laughs> and then I thought, well, if she asked me about the revolution, I'm really screwed because I typed the revolution in July and I couldn't quite remember whether it was King George or, uh, you know, I mean, remember that phrase, you don't learn it until you teach it. I used to, you know, I, it took me five periods through to stand back from my lecture notes and pretend I'd known all day long what was in those notes, you know. So I said, you know, if she asked me about the revolution, I'm in trouble, but uh, I couldn't let her sit there like that forever. So I screwed my courage to the sticking point and, and finally said, yes, Martha, you know, and every once in a while I wake up at night, you know, with a jerk, you know, and I realize I've been dreaming about the question, you know. And, I can remember, you know, her smiling away, you know, and she said to me, well, Mr. George, how come we have to know what's in your notes if you don't know yet, you know? <laughs> and uh, I've been trying to find an answer to that question for 20 years. The problem is nobody ever told me that a junior high was supposed to be different from a university, and I pretended for a long, long time that I was just a miniature university professor and in many of my classes, uh, the, my notes became the students' notes really without passing through the minds of either one of us. <laughs> and uh, as it turns out, 
I'm not sure I did a whole lot of teaching and I'm not sure they did a whole lot of learning. The junior high was kept a secret from me. Nobody ever told me what the early adolescents were like. Nobody ever suggested that we ought to design the school based on what the kids needed to know. Uh, of course, the original junior high people wanted to do that. Uh, and the modern middle school is really nothing more in many ways than the revitalization of the original junior high movement. Uh, in addition to this new mission, this new vision, uh, there are uh, what I would say new methods, new programs, new ways of implementing the vision, of making progress toward uh, the, vi the mission's accomplishment that work, believe it or not. We now have enough uh, evidence and experience to know, for example, that the middle school's creation of smallness within bigness is a really unique contribution to American education. That creating a tension between size and smallness, between uh, caring and uh, quality, that uh, creating a place that allows for enrichment and high standards at the same time focuses on a sense of community and a caring climate where people are known and identified and cared about, that that really works well. Uh, in the, the modern middle school movement, we emphasize programs that match what we say we believe in. And middle school people put their money where their mouth is. And they create programs they implement programs that they say they believe in. And good middle schools all over the country now, more and more and more, are implementing the interdisciplinary team organization, advisor-advisee programs, schools within a school, long-term teacher-student relationships that go beyond nine months, 45 minutes a day. We're engaged in programs that de-emphasize individual one-on-one -on -one competition and re-emphasize group cooperation, collaboration, and group competition. Uh, we are de-emphasizing uh, the destructive aspects of, of homogeneous grouping, uh, otherwise known as tracking, and finding that middle school people are making real progress towards inventing new ways for all kinds of learners to be together. And we are organizing and operating school events so that not just the top 10% get everything. Middle schools have for 25 years focused on changing what we do outside the classroom so that it meets the needs of those learners and recognizes the need of every learner for success and recognizes the vulnerability of every learner in the school. We didn't do that 35 years or so ago. I was uh, born eight days after Greggy Duval. Greggy Duval was perfect. Now, uh, Greggy's father, uh, Big Red, and my father, Big Paul, were big buddies, which meant that all through our growing lives, this is before TV, I'm here to tell you, all through our growing lives, we were, we were together. Constantly, vacations, celebr you know, holidays, uh, Sunday afternoons. Greggy, you know, he and I still spend our lives together, and he was so perfect. I went home not too long ago. My mother ran out onto the tarmac, threw her arms around my neck, and said, "Guess what? Greggy's building a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house on the shores of Lake Michigan. He's putting in a heated pool, even though he has a hundred and fifty feet of waterfront." And I said, boy, it's great to be home, Mom. <laughs> yep. Greg, he was, he was so perfect. He went all the way through junior high and never once got a zit down here in this spot where your nose connects to your upper lip. I got one a week right there like that, you know, with a big yellow thing on the end of it, you know. And, you know, Greg, he, uh, we had these things that we used to wear what they call khaki trousers. And you probably don't remember those, but they, they had a, a belt buckle that went across the butt. A whole generation of us kids wore those pants with the belt buckle across the butt. Nobody ever said, what is that belt buckle doing on your rear end, you know? <laughs> and you put them on, and you looked like an accordion down the front of your trousers within five minutes. Greggy could wear those pants for weeks. 
and the crease, uh, the crease in his pants could cut paper, you know? It was, it was like his mother was hiding around the corner with a hot iron, and when you didn't look, she creased his pants. I couldn't figure out any other way he could have possibly maintained it like that. And Greggy had his growth spurt two years before any of the rest of us, you know? For two years, we had to stand around after PE watching Greggy grow, you know? <laughs> He, he was so perfect. We used to have uh, what they <clears throat> we used to have what they call the awards day assembly in our junior high. Uh, middle schools have since done away with those uh, uh, frequently. Uh, but back when I did it, it was a sacred ritual. Back when I was involved in it, it was really close to the heart of the school. It always happened the third week of May. It always happened Friday or Thursday morning, and it was always 90 minutes. And in my school, it happened, you know, in a, in a room pretty much like this, uh, except that over here in the corner, the uh, junior high band director is, uh, the, the kids always marched in in a sacred ritual. The last, the oldest kids got to wait till the end, but got to sit in the front. And the youngest kids had to come in right away, but had to sit in the back. And as we marched in, the junior high band was played in this cacophony that nobody could name, but that everybody could identify. <laughs> have, have you ever seen junior high band director's thighs? <laughs> There's some people that really, they, they get no respect whatsoever. But if you've ever tried to beat a sense of rhythm into a 14-year, you know, it's darn near impossible. And uh, in my school, at least, if you look down front and there's this ascending array of the ugliest look looking statues you've ever seen, and uh, big stacks of see-through gray packages with ugly felt letters in them. And in my school, it always, uh, no matter what, uh, the junior high coach was always walking back down front. You ever notice how junior high coaches walk? Uh, in order to be, excuse me, coach, in order to be a junior high coach, when you walk, you got to make your head go like this. Really important. 
pregnant and squeeze it hard. <laughs> or he got to say something really nasty about his mother. <laughs> it's, it used to be army shoes back then. It's a whole different scene now, but it's still, it's still the mother. Uh, and Grady would come down and he'd get his statue and he'd be on his way back and just about ready to sit down. And it's, it's time for the, the junior high basketball most valuable player of the world. And to everyone's surprise, it's great. He knew all. He knew all the city again. And he's down here and gets his statue and he's about ready to go back and sit down. And his president's physical fitness award. Great. He chinned himself 38,000 times. He played every male in a 50 mile radius. And he's on his way back down. And uh, he's just about, uh, he got the, the, the whole thing going. It's uh, time for the president of the student council to give out the remaining award. 1,400 kids are not surprised and not happy about it. And clapping out for Grady, for Grady to come back down and give out you know, the remaining three awards uh, to the rest of us who have mortgaged our futures so that we can be Greggy's buddies for two years. And at the end of 90 minutes, Greggy has 18 awards and nobody else has anything much. I was in a middle school, unfortunately, in Florida, not too long ago, walked in the door and where the, you know, the trophy case was, smatter, you know, splashed all over the trophy case was the Miss Springtime Contest. There were 12 girls' pictures on that uh, huge bulletin board. If you've never been to Florida, you've never been to that school, I'll bet you could tell me what those 12 girls looked like. Of course, they were all white, but they all had, or they were all blonde, and they all had complexions that Helena Rubinstein would have turned herself out into the street to get, and they all had just a suggestion of secondary sexual characteristics. And they all had that smile, just like Martha Coger, you know? And there were 12 girls there, and the school had gotten itself into the position of sorting out who could and who couldn't qualify to be potentially Miss Springtime. The school had decided that 12 girls who all looked alike and acted alike and talked alike and dressed alike, that those 12 girls epitomized the best about the school, and 600 others were too late. Well, I tell you, at 13, it's too soon to start sorting out the world into the Miss Springtimes, into the what, Miss Winters? In Central Florida, being Miss Winter at 13 is no big deal, I'm here to tell you. It's too soon to start deciding who is and who can and who deserves to get the best that the school has to offer. Middle schools avoid that sort of thing. Middle schools find ways for everybody to get recognized, for everybody to experience success, and for kids to be involved in age-appropriate activities. My son came home uh, last year as an eighth grader and announced to me that he had agreed to go in on the rental of a limousine to go to his eighth grade prom. And I tell you, I went berserk. Yeah. And uh, needless to say, he didn't go to the prom in a limousine, and there aren't going to have a prom there this year after I stirred up uh, four or 500 parents. So the idea that eighth grade kids ought to be taking limousines to proms, he's going to want to jet to Jamaica when he's a junior. I mean, what's the point? And what are we saving? Is there anything in high school worth waiting for? Or does everybody have to have it by the time they leave elementary school? You know, David Elkind's... David Elkind's books, The Hurried Child and the one about young adolescents, all grown up and no place to go, make a lot of sense to me. What are we hurrying for? And are we precipitating kids into much more difficulty than they're ready to handle? Good middle schools have programs that match the characteristics and needs of the students, that match the mission. Third, what we're involved in here is, in many ways, uh, a new membership, a new community, 
uh, a, a new bunch of folks working together. Every mission in American history is characterized by a group of people who work together across state lines, spreading the word in workshops and journals and meetings. And the middle school movement is successful because of its membership. It's not just inspired beginners uh, with little to lose. Like other movements in American history, the middle school movement has a membership that is characterized as often as not by people with whole careers to put on the line, people who come together to find each other. Uh, when I was a kid, we played Get Lost a lot. You know, the favorite game was hide and seek. I used to hate it, you know, because I'd go off and pick this great hiding place, and my whole sense of self-esteem was dependent on whether or not anybody would find me. You know, nobody ever did. These days, the, the new game, is, I'm told, is sardines. In sardines, one person goes off and hides, and the rest hunt for him. And as soon as one person finds him, they sit down and snuggle together and, and stay warm and friendly and cuddly till the next person finds him. And everybody ends up in the same place together. You know, the message of the middle school movement is not get lost, it's get found. Come together in a way that, that finds you in new and different relationships with people who believe the same sort of thing. We've found each other. Uh, nobody's saints and nobody's perfect, but it's a, it's a different kind of a membership. It's an egalitarian movement. It's not a role-based situation. If we took time to take a toll of this audience, I think we'd find parents, we'd find teachers, we'd find college students, we'd find school administrators, we'd find board members, we'd find Department of Education people. The middle school movement's membership is unique. It's a very diverse group of people who have been uh, finding each other for years now. Next month, there will be 10,000 people at the uh, 17th Annual Convention of the National Middle School Association. I was at the first one 17 years ago where there were 200. From 200 to 10,000 in 17 years isn't all that bad. There are more and more and more and more people signing on to this middle school movement. Movements require leaders, but a movement really is composed of much more than leaders. Movements find new leaders when one or a group are uh, cut down or removed or retire. The middle school movement is, is more than leaders, uh, and probably uniquely so. It's composed of people who are content to do their jobs outside the limelight for years on end without a whole lot of recognition, content to do the best they know how for the middle school adolescents uh, that they have come to, to know and enjoy. Uh, there's something about middle school people that is a lot like middle school kids. You know, we identify middle school kids as the the herd of the absurd on the range of the strange and the hormonally handicapped, the testosterone poisoned and all of that sort of thing. I did notice a study some time ago, I, and this is true, where the, uh, I discovered that uh, the uh, researcher said that the average 13-year-old boy thinks about sexual intercourse once every 11 seconds. <laughs> At 50, 11 seconds seems like an awfully long time. Uh, and they said that these days, the thought lasts for nine seconds. So that teachers uh, these days have a two second window of opportunity uh, to insert what it is uh, they believe to be important in the middle of all of that. Now there, there's nothing new about uh, this membership really. It's just bigger than it used to be. There were folks out there a long time ago doing it the way it ought to be done. Uh, my uh, eighth grade English teacher was one of them. And when I got to eighth grade, uh, I encountered Miss Pauline Vescio. Miss Vescio had been there for a long, long time. In fact, she taught my father. She taught Big Paul eighth grade English, and we think she may have taught my grandfather. She was at least uh, 250 years old by the time I got there, and no one uh, in a 30-mile radius had ever remembered uh, anyone else ever teaching eighth grade English. Miss Vescio was a strange woman in many ways. 
a lot like the kids, but in, in a lot of ways, uh, unlike them. Uh, not only was she a very old person, but she was uh, very short. She was about four foot seven, I think, and weighed about, oh, at the time it seemed four or 5,000 pounds anyway. And she had, this was back before uh, corrective eye surgery. She had what they called a wall eye. One eye looked out like that, and the other one eye looked out just like that. You know, so she was a natural for eighth grade. She could just <laughs> twist her head and survey the classroom. And she wore these glasses, you know, that they were like binoculars, like Coke bottles. Nobody could ever tell exactly where Miss Vescio was looking. And uh, I was cursed that year. Uh, Big Paul was elected president of the school board. You know, it just killed me. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I was trying to do everything I knew how to get away from uh, Big Paul's shadow as it was, and some really stupid things, I suppose. And you know, uh, teachers like Miss Vescio kept going as long as they did, I think, at least in part because they could find new challenges every year uh, and some new goal each year to keep them going and, and vigorous. And, I guess that year I was Miss Vescio's goal. Uh, you know, she decided that I was going to own up to everything Big Paul stood for and to be, be the kind of eighth grade kid that the son of the president of the school board ought to be. And uh, so she sat, I'll never forget, she, she had her room in rows, of course, uh, and uh, she put me in the first seat in the first row by the wall next to the hall. And uh, her father was she was, pres was the foreman of Kunkel's Lumber Yard. And she always had, she must have had a million of these cheap painter's yard sticks, you know, they're so flimsy you can almost crack them like a black snake whip. And she would walk the classroom. Uh, I never, ever saw Miss Vecchio sit down. Uh, that was one of the things I was interested to see in Japan, the last visit I made there. I spent two months looking at Japanese seventh grade teachers, never, never once did I see the seventh grade teacher sit down uh, in the presence of students? And Miss Vescio never did either. Uh, and I never could understand that, uh, but she used to walk the classroom and swing that yardstick, and she'd get in the aisle between uh, the wall and my row, and you know, uh, that 11 second business, when I was 13, I was setting Olympic records at that particular feat. <laughs> And Miss Vescio seemed to be able to sense, you know, when the glaze would come over my eyes. And she'd take that yardstick and crack it up against the wall. You know, boy, it'd go off like a rifle shot, you know. And I would jerk back to homonyms, synonyms, and anonyms and from wherever or with whomever I had been. And uh, this was, an, I tell you, this was an epic struggle. I, it, was a, it was a colossal confrontation between two titans, an eighth grade jerk and uh, a uh, classic eighth grade teacher. It went on for months and months and months and months. My, my uncle Sheik came back from the Korean War with all kinds of important parts blown off of. One of them was his right forearm, and they gave him one of the first prostheses, uh, and had a, he had a big claw and a, a knobby uh, down here in his, his uh, elbow, and when he twisted that knob, he could make a grip. He, he was a steel worker in Pittsburgh. He used to tell me that he ate his lunch hanging from a girder, you know. Uh, Miss Vescio could do that without the prosthesis, you know. She had what, uh, what we used to call the eagle claw. And she was the first teacher in history to, to notice this uh, uh, nerve that runs from the bottom of your neck to the end of your shoulder. And every once in a while, when, it got, uh, when I was particularly uh, distant, the eagle claw would land on my shoulder and she'd squeeze and I'd smile and she'd squeeze and boy, the tears would come to my eyes. Uh, and uh, you know, it, was, it was really a struggle worthy of, of commentary. In one particular situation in early May, I guess it was, uh, she had said something about uh, we were gonna all come in after school that night. You know, there wasn't any busing or anything in this little mining town. We just had to walk home. And she said, you're all gonna be here this afternoon and we're gonna work on whatever it was until you get it right. And uh, in a particularly asinine way, I can remember saying, oh yes, yeah, sure we are, Miss Vescio, sure we are. And a strange thing happened to Miss Vescio. You know, her face got all blotchy. And 
uh, she could just, I could see the fire in her eyes, even through those uh, Coke bottle kind of glasses, you know. And she walked over, me, uh, over to me and she took that yardstick and she said, you'll be here, George. And she took that yardstick and she went, wham, down across my back. You know, the thing splintered, flew all over the, the classroom and boy, there was this hush, you know, because nobody was really sure that even Miss Vescio, I don't think, uh, had, was convinced that that was the proper intervention for the son of the president of the school board. And you know, this silence hung in the air until the bell rang, mercifully. And of course, you know, you, you, Miss Vescio dismissed you. You didn't just get up and leave. And she dismissed row one by the windows, row two, and so on, and put her hand out to me and, dis, and dismissed the rest of the row. And, I wasn't really sure whether this was the time I should go out the back window or not, because I, I recognized I'd gone over the edge here. And uh, she beckoned to me like Ahab from the whale. And finally, I went up and I stood beside her. And you know, with Miss Vescio, you could not get out unless you were dismissed. You know, you could go over Miss Vescio, but you could not get past Miss Vescio. And I can remember saying, Miss Vescio, may I be excused? And she reached out and grabbed hold of me and yanked me way up in there. And with Miss Vescio, it was way up in there. You know? But she's jerking me back and forth. And she said, oh, Paul, you know I love you, don't you? And I'm like, oh, yes, Miss Vescio, I know you love me. And I can feel my face getting red just thinking about this. And then she delivered the coup de grace, you know. She pulled me up and she gave me a big kiss right on the lips, you know. And she was the wettest kisser I've ever met. And there are 38 kids out in the hallway. Oh, Miss Vescio's kissing Paul George. You know? And I was humiliated. And, and I gave up. I capitulated. It, the struggle was over at that point. Well, I went back to my uh, 30th annual high school reunion just uh, not too long ago. And uh, if the truth were known, I really wanted to see Miss Vescio. And uh, she wasn't there. She had retired. I'm sure she'd been forced out. She had never would have. Uh, of uh, quit voluntarily. She'd been elected to the school board, uh, but she was ill and very old and uh, didn't come to the reunion dinner that night. So I went home and disappointed. I said to my mother, well, you know, I was really sorry that Miss Vescio wasn't there tonight. I'd really like to have told her uh, how important she turned out to be to me. And, and my mother, being my mother, said, why don't you call her and tell her? And, you know, I think about doing things like that, but I never do it. And I said, well, you know, maybe I will. And she said, well, why don't you do it tonight? And I said, well, maybe I will. And she said, well, why don't you do it right now? And I said, well, maybe I will. And she said, well, there's the phone, you know. <laughs> so I pick up the phone and I dial and it rings and rings and rings four or five times. Anyway, I'm just about ready to hang up and this old tired voice comes on the line and says, yes. And I said, Miss Vescio? And she said, yes. And I said, this is Paul George, you know, and I launched into this litany of descriptors that I thought would bring my memory back from the deep, dark recesses of her mind. I hadn't seen her for 35 years. And she cut me off, boy. She said, I remember you well, Paul George. And I said, well, Miss Vescio, uh, I was here tonight for the class of 58 uh, reunion dinner. And I, was, I wanted, just wanted to let you know that I was disappointed that I didn't get a chance to see you. And she said, oh, Paul. That's very nice. And I said, well, you're really going to be surprised to hear this, Miss Vescio, but I've been doing OK the last 30 years. And, and she said, oh, Paul, isn't that nice? And I said, well, you're really going to be surprised to hear this, Miss Vescio. I was a junior high eighth grade teacher for a decade. And I said, you're really going to be surprised to hear this, Miss Vescio, but I thought you were a fabulous teacher. You know, and she said to me, oh, Paul, I said, you know I love you, don't you? Yeah. And she did, of course. She could bring together toughness and caring in a way I've never seen. Uh, she could bring quality and, and, and uh, community together in the same classroom. She was tough, but boy, you learned and you loved it. These days, we know that she wasn't unique and that there are more and more and more and more Miss Vescios all around choosing to teach eighth graders dedicating themselves to working with middle school students and administrators who've decided they don't need to go back and be the high school principal in order for their career to have meaning. Finally, uh, there's one other reason why I think this middle school business is really making a difference, and that is 
a new sense of meaning professionally and personally. You know, we're not selling Amway or Shackley or Avon here. We're involved with children and youth. We're involved with the future, as many people have said, many different ways. Many of us, I think, look at the country and lament much of the changes in recent decades, not all, but mu much of what's happened. And I think we're all searching for a way to make a change, to make our own individual commitment felt. I believe that one very real reason for the success of the middle school movement is that people like you either have made or are contemplating making a, what will turn out to be a profound, life-shaping, personal decision that your life professionally has got to have purpose, that it's got to have meaning, that it's got to make a difference, that it's got to change the world in some important and positive way. George Burns understands that. You know, I heard him being interviewed uh, a while ago, and the interviewer was uh, asking about the secret of his success and his momentum, how he could sustain it so far and so well for so long. And uh, Burns thought about it for quite a while and eventually said to the uh, interviewer, uh, you know, he was talking about he turned down a five-year contract at uh, Caesar's Palace because he uh, wasn't sure they were going to be around that long. And he's, he's booked himself into uh, the London Palladium for two weeks on his 100th birthday. And uh, he thought about it and, and uh, thought about it and said what has stuck in my mind ever since. He said, you've got to be in love with your future. And I think George Burns is right. I see lots and lots and lots and lots of kids out there these days who are not sure there's a future to be in love with, who are not convinced that their own lives have purpose and meaning and significance and direction. And I believe that at least part of the reason for the success of the middle school movement is that you've chosen to make a difference, that you've chosen to find your way into that part of education where people are bringing what they have and joining together to create a school where more and more kids are able to believe that there is a future that they can be in love with. Now, there aren't any perfect middle schools out there, and there aren't any saints in the middle school movement, and we may not achieve everything that we've set out to achieve. But that's not the point, really. A movement is not a destination. It really is a journey. You may have seen the Avon or the old uh, uh, counseling posters around uh, with a beautiful picture of a ship in a harbor and the comment that says, a ship in a harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are made for. I believe your presence here tonight indicates that you are among those people who understand that it's the attempt, it's the struggle, it's the effort that counts, it's the voyage and not the destination that matters. Americans have always been that way. Americans have always understood that it's the process that counts. It's the goal that matters. It's the struggle. It's how you play the game that makes the difference. Uh, a long time ago, uh, a poet American that I'm still fond of put it this way, reckless O soul, exploring, I with thee and thou with me, sail forth, steer for the deep waters only, for we are bound where mariner has not yet dared to go, and we will risk the ship, ourselves and all. O oh, my brave soul, O oh, farther, farther sail, O oh, daring joy but safe, are they not all the seas of God? O oh, farther, farther, farther sail. I'm thrilled to be on the journey with you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. Dr. George has agreed to uh, field some questions uh, for a period of time, so if any of you have some questions, you'd like to ask.
My last teaching assignment was, was seventh grade math. Uh, and all that means is that if you need to get up and move out, you're not going to bother me at all. You know, so if you want to ask a question, shout it out, and I'll shout out a response to you, and, and we'll do that till it uh, is impossible or doesn't make sense anymore. Anybody have a question? I've got a great lecture on the origin and development of the Latin Grammar School in Eastern Kentucky. <laughs> Going once? Well, I'll hang around up here for a few minutes, and then if people want to talk, why don't we do that? Otherwise, enjoy the refreshments. <laughs>